All right, so we want to do this quick and fast in a, a sort of 10, 12 minutes fire chat. Jonathan Becker from Eventure today mentioned something about the mega trends that he and his team at his firm are looking at. Could you share with us um, how are you looking at these transformational trends that might transform humanity? Uh, and what are these trends? Whoever wants to start. I, I believe in the singularity, so soon I'll be uploading my brain to the internet. Yep, agree. I don't think anybody wants me to upload my brain, but I want to tell, say something about thematic investing, which is a term I actually learned from Sitar on a panel once, <laughs> and I've tried to use since. And, and thematic investing basically says, let's look at some mega trends, and, and um, let's try to follow them. And, and every fund that I've been a part of, we've had the conversation about trying to look at megatrends and say, oh, mobile or software or 3D printing or digital fabrication. And it actually is a great conversation for, a, for an offsite for partners, but it never holds up as an investment for, for actual like investments. Because then you meet someone you love. And, and at least the, the way that I, I like to invest is, is, like, uh, is like dating, right? I like to fall, you know, I fall in love with someone, with an idea, with a market, with, and, and maybe for a bigger fund, it, it works uh, to do thematic investing. And maybe if you're in the valley, where there's just hundreds or thousands of, of, of companies and you're flooded and you have to sort of boil it down. If you're SV Angels and you look at 5,000 companies a year and you're trying to invest in 150, and then you have to look at thematic investing. So what you're saying that this top-down view doesn't hold to the reality of bottom-up, ideas just coming up and getting executed. Idea Any yeah. other views from the others? I think it's more, uh, so I remember this, this, I think it was in Bucharest actually that we Bucharest. had this, we had this discussion. So my, my issue with thematic investing is uh, by the time a lot of these trends or themes become obvious, the, the, the really good bets have been made and what you get is like the dredges of startup land where it's like everyone's just following a trend and a lot of times it's very difficult to find out who you should invest in. And even if it's not the case, even if there are lots of still good startups available, if your only thesis is online video is big, that's not really investable, right? So, so what, what, we, what we like to do uh, at, at Connect is thesis-driven investment. And thesis-driven investment is you might look at mega trends, you might look at things happening in the market, but you form a thesis around specifically what's happening. So if I think about City Mapper, which is one of the first investments we made, you know, the, the thesis, it was, it was quite complex, but I'll, I'll try to boil it down, which is that you know, cities are, are increasingly becoming the growth engine of the world. Population is shifting very rapidly to cities. Uh, the newer cities especially rely heavily on public transport and public transport needs to become much, much more efficient. And public transport uh, authorities are terrible at technology, and they're terrible at consumer technology. And when you have mobile phones, you have the opportunity to build a far better way for consumers to interact with public transport than you've ever had before. And that was sort of the nexus around, around city mapper. And if you think about where the cities are going for the next 10 years, you know that dovetails in very well with a, a mobile-centric approach to giving people information about public transport and what's happening in their urban environment. Mm -hmm. That's a thesis-driven approach. Thematic would be mobile's hot, let's look, find mobile apps mm -hmm. that do stuff with, I don't know, things that people are gonna use every day. That's thematic. And I think it's very, very hard to build, to invest in really great companies, especially at seed stage with thematic investing. Right. I, I think the largest problem, in our opinion, with thematic investing is these spaces tend to get crowded awfully quick um, because sort of everybody jumps on the bandwagon. In the end, early stage investing, in my opinion, is very much around um, also opportunistic approach towards the teams. Um, a lot of it is around you know the dedication of individuals. Of course, they need to be in the right space, and I think um, you you will always have a certain boundary condition check whether that space actually makes sense and whether the themes there you know contradict uh, your know, beliefs. But in the end, there's so many obstacles towards uh, success that I think you know, the more operational questions around the team, around you know, will they be able to get something done, is just as important as a big theme. And so we tended to be more successful with things where we believed in the people and, of course, in a theme that in a broad sense makes sense than around you know, trying to follow certain trends. Michael, your firm is fairly big. I guess you can afford a couple of analysts if you want to deal with <laughs> these megatrends. Do you actually do that? And what might be the horizon of time where you feel you can foresee the future? 
Yeah. So it's interesting. So we actually fall somewhere between sort of thesis and thematic. We have sort of the effort around big data. We have around the 100 million fund around big data, which is probably as broad as you can get in terms of sort of being able to get lost in it. And um, it's, some of it is a self-fulfilling prophecy because we have this fund out there and we do a lot around marketing it and creating an ecosystem. We actually were able to attract a lot of people early on where big data was even sort of less clearly defined than it is today. You know, so, so Cloudera, one of the, you know, the, the leading uh, Hadoop distributor, we started that company right around the thesis and, and you know, ha had some great entrepreneurs join us partially because we early on raised our hand and we said, hey, we're really committed to this big data thing. We're spending a lot of time and resources on it. And then entrepreneurs in early days felt comfortable with us as a partner. So that's one case, but then on the other, I agree, there is just so much stuff out there, and it's, I think the toughest part is innovation a lot of times happens without people saying our innovation is within big data. People just say, hey, we have a really great idea, and we say, we agree, we're really excited about that idea. And then afterwards, people say, oh, this was, it turns out this was SaaS, or it turns out this was mobile. But back in, when you make the investment, it's not really that clear, right? And every now and then you get lucky and you, you know, you get behind a trend that actually gets big and then you can, you know, do the whole thematic stuff, but it's somewhere in between. Um, before on stage, I watched each of you, you somehow all shared the niceties in the sense you were pitching yourself. Uh, but if we turn the table around once again, um, what sort of behavior of an entrepreneur, what occurrences really bring out the worst in you in the wake of an investment? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That was a uh, loud question. Yeah. Such a Maybe long list. Talking from experience, no, anything uh, that had happened already that rang a bell in my question? It's not that, I mean, I think anything kind of brings out the worst. It's just sort of what can be the most frustrating. And what kind of what I find the most frustrating is the inability to accept reality repeatedly. Right, so it, there's like a certain amount of inability to accept reality that you need to be an entrepreneur. It's why you're an entrepreneur, right? Like it's, it's not accepting the way things are that, that makes you kind of do amazing things. But there's a level of which when it's not working out, you have to accept that it's not working out. And it's that sort of stubbornness to like just repeatedly refuse to kind of deal with, with, with reality. So that's one. And the other, and this one is probably my, my like peak one, which is you refuse to make Decisions. Okay. It, that, that, that one really, really annoys me. There's, um, I'll tell you two things. First of all, there was a book, a book that I think did a lot of damage to the uh, startup uh, ecosystem. Walter Isaacson wrote a book about Steve Jobs. And it was a, a great book about, about Steve Jobs. And then for um, a year after, everybody came with turtlenecks and said, I'm a product driven entrepreneur. I only do, <laughs> I only care about product. And you can actually hear people quoting the book. And I think that's one of the problems, and it's actually a, pro a Berlin problem, I have to say, as a Berlin VC. Um, unfortunately, it's a Berlin problem, but people want to play entrepreneurs. They want to be cool. They want to be in the ecosystem. They want to have cool, to do cool stuff. They want to talk the talk and walk the walk. They don't want to take the risk. Um, in the end, they're looking for, for a salary. And um, the, the worst thing to have is this hour-long meeting where people talk about vision and entrepreneurship, blah, blah, blah. and in the end, they pull out you know, the, the, the last slide about budget, and there's a salary for the founders of 10,000 euros a month. And you're saying, well, if you want to work for me, just say so. You should have just said so in the beginning. If you want to be employees, we're looking for, we're looking for an associate. We are, by the way, looking for an associate, if anyone's interested. Um, <laughs> okay. That's Applications accepted after the talk? Sorry? Applications accepted after you? Exactly. Talk. You can come, come talk to me after. And the, and the second thing is a mistake that I, did, I made when I was fundraising for, for, for a startup. Um, and it's flip-flopping. And, and people tend to flip-flop. Uh, some, some entrepreneurs flip-flop, particularly about, about, by the way, financials and about their plans for the future. And there's nothing worse than having a conversation with someone and he comes with an idea. And it might even be, we don't do much seed. So it's an A an Aaron company and we talk about international expansion and he says, I thought about Italy and Romania. And I said, well, that's, that doesn't sound like a good idea. And then he said, well, you know what, we can also do France and Turkey <laughs> or Poland and Zimbabwe. And he's trying to figure out if I'm what I'm interested in. 
And, and that's probably a huge mistake on his part, and it's a big, big turnoff on my part. If you have, I want to know that you thought the ideas through before you showed up in my office and, and spent an hour. I want to know that you're, you believe in what you say. You mentioned the book, uh, the one that is a bad example because it doesn't make uh, entrepreneurs authentic. I can recommend a good one. Maybe you have read it from Ben Horowitz, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which really goes into the depth of building a company with all the difficulties. Other experiences from you guys, uh, what brings out the worst in you, in your investments, certain Arrogance. behaviors? Arrogance, big pet peeve. I mean, most of the time when I meet with someone, they either know much, much more than I about what they're talking about or sometimes less than I. And in either case, being humble and actually having a conversation is the best solution. Uh, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. So the other flip side is somebody who is not self-assured at all, which is bad as well. But you don't want to overshoot into the stratosphere. It's just really irritating uh, and also makes me wonder because I think part of working together is around having a conversation and receiving feedback and sort of reacting sometimes to encouragement or criticism and if in the first pitch you already come across as sort of a one-way train into nowhere uh, kind of tough to, to imagine working together and, and being a team in the long run. Ralph? Well I'd say you know, initially in the initial stages inability to listen I think that's uh, that's along those lines if people are just sort of they only have sort of the send function um, and basically don't show any willingness to, to listen initially. That's difficult. And I would say later on it's pragmatism. I think one of the, the core elements of an entrepreneur is pragmatically solving you know, new issues all the time. And if, if, if that's not given, it's difficult. You've been around for 13 years with Target, 12 years with Target Partners, as you said before. Well, so I've seen quite a lot of business plans, 14,000, a lot of 35 investments. Yeah, so I don't think I have anything meaningful to add, though. I think these are all the same reactions I have. I don't like arrogance. I, d I don't like single uh, directional communication. I do like uh, the ability to brainstorm. And if you have a good team and we can work on a, uh, an interactive basis, I think that's the positive side. And if you notice that it, there's you know, not an interactive brainstorming option in the relationship, it's a bad thing because, as you say, it's a long-term relationship. All right. We got 10 minutes. Now we have 12. So thank you very much. Please give a big hand for our panelists. I think it was two questions with uh, interesting answers. Thank you very much. <laughs>